Vanity of vanity, all is vanity, are the opening lines of Ecclesiastes. This unique book was written by the preacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, and has traditionally been ascribed to Solomon. Ecclesiastes is one cog in the wisdom machine of the Old Testament. It's nestled among a body of books, sagely wise books, that were all produced during Israel's golden age. While Proverbs is filled with pithy sayings and wise counsel, Ecclesiastes focuses more on autobiographical or experiential knowledge. Ecclesiastes almost reads like a journal written from the perspective of someone who has seen it all and is ready to pass on his perspective to the next generation. Now, there's been tremendous debate among scholars about whether or not the preacher had an ultimately optimistic or pessimistic view of life. If you read Ecclesiastes 1 in the New International Version, you'll see, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Then after reading that, you'll become depressed enough to need a, a long nap. But the Hebrew word hebel rendered vanity, meaningless in the NIV, but vanity in most English translations, is sort of a tricky one to accurately translate. James Smith provides this helpful explanation, quote, The word means primarily a breath or vapor, such as one might see when exhaled breath condenses on a cold day. The word is used poetically of all that is fleeting, perishable, transitory, frail, and unsatisfying. In this context, the word suggests the futility of human effort. The rest of the book is a commentary on this verse. In asserting that all is vanity, the writer is referring to things mundane and human. Man's works, not God's works, are vain. Thus, it seems the observations made by the preacher are of necessity both optimistic and pessimistic. Optimistic when God is involved, pessimistic when he is not. For example, the preacher pondered his long life filled with toil and labor and what he would leave behind for his children with this dour assessment, Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet, he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Well, that's quite pessimistic. But on the other hand, if wisdom prevails in the lives of those who inherit his life's work, then the preacher could remark in this way in the next chapter, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 22. So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? I think anyone who's lived long enough can understand and relate to the preacher's dilemma. Sometimes life is filled with sorrow, tragedy, hardship, and it feels vain, meaningless. Yet at other times, there's tremendous cause for joy, triumph, celebration, and glory to God. And this is exactly the tension of Ecclesiastes. I think Dave Bland does an excellent job with this analysis in his commentary, quote, A key to understanding the message of Ecclesiastes lies in considering the relationship between these two components— the history of the interpretation of Ecclesiastes demonstrates the tendency to come down either on the side of the vanity conclusion or on the side of the joy passages, one eclipsing the other. Thus, the reader comes away deciding that Ecclesiastes is either pessimistic or optimistic in outlook. These two poles, however, do not cancel out each other. 
There are times when God tears down, and there are times when he builds up. The poles remain in tension with one another all through the course of the book. The preacher clings tenaciously to both. Life is vanity. But in the midst of vanity, God gives enjoyment. In the face of the uncertainties of life, contentment is possible. This is precisely where God's wonderful love peers through the dark clouds of life. When all seems hopelessly vain, the knowledge of God's eternality surpasses life's shadow of death. This is why the preacher could close his wise book with these words in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of, of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. By reminding his readers of their responsibilities before the Lord, the preacher lifts the eyes of all of us above the the muck and mire and vanity of this life to that life which is yet to come. The judgment of God, which brings eternal blessings and reward for all the faithful, for all those who live a life that could never be described as vanity.